I uh, was born and raised Kiowa, but I was living on the Shoshone side of the Wind River Reservation in Fort Washakie, Wyoming. This is my palette. There's certain things that I own. All my friends were all Shoshone, and I, I went to uh, high school with, you know, the busload of Shoshone kids that was uh, driven into town to go to the white high school. I definitely knew that I was not from there. Uh, the way that we dressed when we danced, which was a really big social event when the powwows would happen, and the style of the dance. My father's white, so I'm half Indian and I'm half white. I was definitely an outsider. The nature of the piece dictates what kind of hide I'm going to use. Some of the hides have blood stains on them, which I kind of like. And some of them don't. Some of them are scarred up and some of them are smooth, depending on what the animal went through. And depending on what the piece is about, that's what I decide how, what part of the hide I want to use. On that reservation, my mother had a trading post. And in that trading post, she sold beadwork. And it was a variety of, of designs and design elements and aesthetic from all over the United States. And it was crawling around behind her cases full of moccasins and whatever that I grew up. She let us take some of the big plastic beads when we were really little, about five years old, and we would string them onto wire and make her these giant necklaces and these giant earrings that there's no way she could get them through her ears. But then when I was about eight years old, I really wanted to learn how to do the bead work that I saw, like the, with the small beads and everything. I was hooked from that point on. Most of the work I do now are stories. The stories just depend on who, what I'm doing or what I'm interested in at the time. When my first child was born, I became very aware of the fact of how very little I knew about Kiowa stories and Kiowa history. So consequently, there was a whole two or three years there where the subject matter, the storylines of almost everything that I was doing was either mythological, Kiowa mythological, or historical in some way. This was my mother's everyday purse that's it's it's really you know worn but this was like i mean this is where she when she went to the grocery store or to the office supply place or whatever this was the purse that she carried when i was a child one of the purses that she carried see this is that shoshone beadwork the pictorial stuff this is what i grew up with some of those bags are probably like the 1920s and 30s and a couple of them i commission artists to make them for me. Almost all the beads in this bag are very old. You can no longer get those. This pink is an old pink, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that pink. And what I like too was um, how they put colors together. Uh, who would have thought to put a pink mane on a horse? Pink legs, pink tail, and pink spots. But it works. Making the leap onto non-traditional objects was probably a gift of being an outsider because I didn't feel necessarily the strictness of having to adhere to what was proper or correct. My rules are is that I try to use traditional techniques and traditional materials, meaning like I only use brain tan deer hide, I do not use commercial tan hide on anything, even if you can't see it, even if I fully beaded something and I could have used canvas underneath it, I will still use the brain tan deer hide underneath it because to me it's important that the spirit of that animal is in it and there's something about that to me that's comforting or, or important, at, le at minimum it's important. And so, while I'm a stickler for the materials and the techniques, the form has changed, and pictorially what I'm able to, what I feel like I'm, it's okay for me to, to illustrate is, uh, is definitely probably not what you would consider traditional. A pair of beaded tennis shoes came into my mother's shop in Fort Washakie when my sister and I, when I was about maybe 13 years old. 
And uh, I thought they were the most fantastic things I had ever seen in my life. I love them. Later on, when I was in college in California, my mother called me up and said, why don't you make a pair of beaded tennis shoes? And I thought she was crazy because it seemed like such an insane amount of work. At that point, I didn't make much more than like a belt buckle. And it was then that I realized that I wasn't bound by the technique, that linear technique. That's when I realized that I could actually could read the shoe, you could read around the shoe, and that no, that the shoes didn't have to match each other. Why did they have to match? You could tell the same story, but more sides of the story by using the entire shoe and looking at it as an object more than as a pair of shoes. The black shoes are called uh, Sun Boys. The Sun Boys are mythical characters among the Kiowa. And I realized my sons were really interested in comic book heroes. Specifically, Spider-Man movies had just come out and they were all about the Spider-Man. And I realized that we had our own heroes that's based on that archetypal hero story of an orphan child with special powers. And that's the Sun Boys. That, that is our half-boy story, that Kiowa half-boy story. And I realized that my children didn't know that story, and they needed to know it. My mother is my litmus test, because I figure that if my mother can understand what I'm doing, whether she gets it visually, uh, you know, whether there's any kind of problems with it or whether it makes her laugh if it's, a, if it's a humorous piece. It has to be understood from a native point of view. The Umbrella was really my first try at telling a long narrative story. So there were like six of these panels that when you pull it apart, I was like, well, this is perfect for telling a story, telling a narrative. So I did a parade scene on it. Usually there's a parade during uh, most powwows. It's the piece that really started my career, what took me many years to call myself, which is an artist. The right to vote piece is and how Native people got the right to vote. In 1924, that vote came to us because uh, Native men in very large numbers, though they were not citizens, fought for the U.S. government in Europe. the way the Indian people teach. You wait for the child to show interest in something, and if they do, then you pursue it with the child. You never say, you're gonna play violin, and you're gonna take violin lessons, and you're gonna become a violin player. It's not like that. It's like, he's interested in learning these songs? All right, come to the drum with me, and I'll teach you these songs, and we'll sing them together, and you know, if you're interested, then you know, you can, you can hang here with us. And that was what she was doing. In her own way, she was teaching us all this information without us even knowing it. 